All right, hi, my name is Philippe Boisvert, and I'm the VP of Enterprise uh, at Boyd. Boyd has solved a wide range of thermal problems uh, at the chip level since the 1970s, and we're really excited to work on the latest challenges. Um, our topic in this session is uh, microchannels in rear door heat exchangers. It's the result of a multi-party collaboration within the OCP ACS door heat exchanger track uh, hosted by John. So uh, we'll start with a quick recap. Uh, door heat exchangers are not new. They've been around for a long, long time in the supercomputer data centers for, for decades. Um, there, they've been typically deployed in heat capture mode uh, with either refrigerant or cold facility water running through them. So they transfer the waste heat into liquid very close to the source and they keep the ambient air in the data center at a reasonable temperature. Some of them are fan assisted, and, but some of them are purely passive relying on the server fans to push the air through. And um, last uh, comment is that tube and fin construction has been a longtime favorite for this, uh, is widely used. Um, but recent advances, uh, advances sorry, in technology uh, are starting to challenge this uh, incumbent. Okay, so to challenge the incumbent, we need to take a look at the basic components of a door heat exchanger so we can see if the challenger can provide an advantage. So first, the door heat exchanger needs a frame to mechanically hold it and allow for movement. Frame size and complexity is directly proportional to the weight of the heat exchanger. Second, uh, active door heat exchangers have a controller for the fan wall to pull the air through. And the size and the Power consumption of the fans is a direct result of the liquid flow, the liquid temperature, the amount of power to be removed. But it's also uh, directly influenced by the air pressure drop through the heat exchanger. So finally, the hex itself is a balancing act between desired heat capture level, liquid flow, and airflow. The go-to fabrication technique is copper tube and fin, and in general, higher power capacity means more rows of tubes leading to higher weights and higher air side pressure drop. So higher air side pressure drop means higher fan power consumption. So the question we aim to answer in our white paper is, is there an alternate hex structure that can help us handle more power with less weight and less fan power? For that, I'll turn the stage over to my colleague Sankar for Dan Foss. Thank you, Philip. Uh, my name is Shankar, I'm from Danfoss. So what we are trying to achieve with this white paper is uh, answer a few questions. And uh, also, first of all, to introduce to the community uh, what microchannel technology is. We would like to give the introduction and background of the microchannel technology, where it has been successful, where it has been uh, not so successful. Then. We will highlight the advantages of using microchannel technology in uh, rear door heat exchangers. Um, the, we will sh we'll show what are the thermal benefits, hydraulic benefits, commodity level, and also at system level, what are the benefits. Then we will do a comparative study between the microchannel heat exchanger and the um, current candidate, which is the tube and fin heat exchanger. Um, for an ORV3 uh, rack, which is of 30 kilowatt uh, air cooling. And finally, we will identify and highlight uh, some of the challenges with aluminum microchannel heat exchanger and how they could be, uh, they could be handled. Having said that, um, just to give a, a brief history of microchannel heat exchanger, microchannel per, per se is not a very new technology. It has been used uh, um, for at least uh, five, five decades, six decades. Uh, and it was initially started in 1970s in the automotive industry. It was an all aluminum construction with uh, radiators, which of course use uh, propylene glycol uh, or ethylene glycol uh, in them. Then in 80s, uh, it was introduced into the electronic cooling space where the real microchannel became so. So the first one, the radiators were really not a microchannel. It was more like a mini channel where the, the channels were um, in the millimeter range. So in 80s, it, when it was introduced to the electronic cooling uh, space, the real microchannel uh, uh, was conceived. Um, 
then by mid 80s and late 80s it was very popular in electronic cooling and uh, still still going strong uh, then in 2000s uh, the the technology was uh, adapted to the stationary hvac industry uh, where somewhere between micro and mini channel was introduced where the channel size is somewhere between 100 microns and 500 microns um, range and then it, around 2008 uh, it was successfully introduced in residential air conditioners so the technology itself is not is not very new it's it has been there but progressive evolution now if you're not familiar with microchannel, just to give a brief uh, overview, uh, it is uh, the, the most important part of the microchannel is this tube here that you see, which we call it a multi-port extruded tube. Um, it is uh, all aluminum with uh, all the small channels inside. And a number of these tubes are inserted into headers on both sides that you see the, the cylindrical here on both sides. And between the tubes are serpentine fins with lures in them. And you close the headers with uh, end caps, and you put some baffles to uh, let the uh, fluid flow in various configurations that you want. Once, once you have all these, you put them into a brazing oven, and it braces, the all aluminum braces, and it becomes a metallurgical bond. Now, what are the advantages of microchannel? So there are a few advantages. First, thermal and hydraulic. What you see here in the right is a uh, old um, the, the tube and fin, where you have a tube and the airflow is coming from left to the right, and you see you see a wake region behind the tube, which basically means it's adding extra pressure drop to the flow, and there is not much heat transfer going on here. Whereas a microchannel, you have a streamlined flow. There is no wake region. That means the overall uh, drag is less, which means less air side pressure drop. So, so the microchannel will give you better thermal uh, performance, better uh, hydraulic performance. Uh, and then um, there is a metallurgical bond between the fin and the tube because it's all braced together. So that means there is no conductive resistance. So overall, uh, there are multiple advantages in thermal and hydraulic space. Coming to the commodity, uh, this is uh, aluminum, so obviously uh, less weight. Um, it is uh, less raw material, um, and it's a low-cost material compared to copper. Um, and also, the, the raw material price for aluminum is very stable. It's not as copper that goes um, up and down all the time. And the, from the ESG perspective, aluminum is 100% 100% recyclable, um, thereby giving a reduced environmental footprint. Coming, coming from a component to a system level, uh, when you use microchannel, you obviously have reduced weight on the heat exchanger, which means a lower system weight. Um, and uh, it has a lower uh, internal volume, which means less f uh, fluid used. And then due to the streamlined airflow, you have um, higher airflow with the same fan power or if you want to keep the same fan power, you can increase the airflow, uh, thereby reducing the uh, inlet temperature difference or the approach temperature. And then with the streamlined airflow, you also get a, a lower noise in the system. So there are multiple advantages of using a microchannel. Now, what we did was uh, we, we took a um, current uh, tube and fin uh, heat exchanger in an ORV3, and then we uh, sized um, an equivalent microchannel heat exchanger um, to, to fit this. So what you see here is the um, is the microchannel rendering of the microchannel that you will see here. So of course, all the connections are not final. Uh, this which needs to be figured out, but it was it will look something like this. Now we. We simulated the, the fin and tube heat exchanger and also the microchannel heat exchanger and uh, just wanted to present the results here. So what you see here is uh, the, the solid lines are all tube and fin and the uh, dotted lines are microchannel. 
and we ran it at multiple air flow rates and multiple uh, fluid, fl fluid fl flow rates through the heat exchanger. And what you see here is that the microchannel and the tube and fin are within plus minus seven percent for the entire range. And as you see, as the airflow increases, the microchannel uh, performance becomes becomes better, which is which is what you would expect. A microchannel really likes high airflow, so uh, the more airflow you can put through the microchannel, the performance becomes better. So now this is okay. This is multiple airflow rates and multiple uh, uh, fluid flow rates, um, and we see that it's it's comparable. So what we did was we took just to highlight the. Uh, highlight the performance, we took one point, which is a 30 kilowatt of cooling with 3500 CFM, which is the typical ORV3 specification. Uh, and we, we compared the microchannel and uh, aluminum, uh, aluminum microchannel and uh, copper finite tube at that point. And this, this point is where is the 3500 uh, CFM point. Uh, and what you see here is the, the solid line is the pressure drop for the fin and tube, and the dot, dotted lines is the uh, pressure drop for microchannel. So for that performance at the same airflow, you have around 59% drop in pressure drop uh, or for a microchannel compared to the fin and tube. So that means it's, you really uh, can save a lot of power when you use microchannel for the same capacity. Just to compare the two technologies side by side, you see that uh, for the same cooling capacity and the uh, airflow, um, the air side pressure drop is uh, around 59% low um, for the microchannel. Uh, the unfilled weight, which is just the heat exchanger weight, is around 78% lower uh, for the for the microchannel. The filled weight, which is with the 25% propylene glycol, is around 73% lower. And then the internal volume for the microchannel is 45% lower. Having said that, there is one point where uh, you have to pay some penalty, and that is on the water side pressure drop, because the, now in the microchannel you have a smaller channels instead of the big round tube, so obviously you will have to pay a little extra for pumping power on the water side, which for this specific case, it's around 59% uh, uh, increase in water side pressure drop. So with that, just to just to rack up and see where it can be applied. So in a in a typical data center, you have the facility water side and the technical uh, water side. Uh, what we have seen is that a microchannel can be um, applied um, very easily, and it has been successful not not in a data center, but in in places where we have facility water side uh, using propylene glycol and microchannel has been very successful. So if you don't have um, the the cold plate in the loop, you can use the microchannel. Uh, directly with no issues, but the, what we intend to do in the white paper and in in the in, in further activity is to see how can we integrate it in the um, uh, in the technical water loop. So there are some things that we need to do about water quality, what are the wetted materials, what kind of inhibitors we need to use, and things like that. So having said that, uh, we would like to invite you to uh, participate in this if if you are. If anyone here who is uh, additive manufacturer, um, the fluid uh, propylene glycol manufacturers or heat exchanger manufacturers, please uh, contact me or Philip or John, and uh, we, we would like your participation. So with that, uh, we are open for questions. Um, uh, in regards to what you've started to do with the um, microchannel testing and such, what have you found as far as the, uh, the corrosion requirements and such like that for uh, maybe dissimilar metals where, you know, you could have the facilities loop on a dry cooler or you could have a copper coil configuration at the facility side and then at the rear door heat exchanger side using the aluminum. Um, what can you speak on as far as uh, the uh, things to take into account or, or what has to be managed? So on a, on a facility water side where there is no cold plate, it's only facility water side, we have, we have not seen any issues. This is not from a data center uh, application, but from typical air conditioning application where we use microchannel and uh, copper all the time together with propylene glycol. We, we have not seen uh, any issues. 
But once it comes to with a coal plate, we need to do some work. We need to see how much, because the coal plate uh, channels are very, very small. Uh, it's not about leaking that I am not, I'm worried about. It's more about blocking the, uh, the micro channel uh, channels in the coal plate. So that needs to be some uh, work done for uh, looking at the inhibitors. Okay, sorry, thank you.